Anybody? The last one's a little tough. Minnesota. What? Good job. <laughs> this is champagne with two stems, one glass of champagne glasses. Great job. Okay. Minnesota. <laughs> What's the percentage of wetlands in Florida currently? <laughs> 30. And who's the largest litigation bank in Florida? It might even be in the country. Farmton. 24,000? 25. 23,500. 23, Wonderful. Great restoration project. Okay, so I'm Victoria with the mitigation banking group. And like I said before, I sell credits. Um, and sometimes I even sell mitigation banks. Been in the industry since 2004. In 2017, I started my own company. That was a leap, but it's been fabulous and uh, very rewarding. It's fine. <clears throat> so a little bit about me. Um, this is my beautiful family. My fiance who's filming. My two little daughters, Lily and Briella. Bella, on the end, that's Brian's daughter, and Shay, her best friend. They're here this weekend, this week. This was at Easter, it was wonderful. But I just want to tell you a little bit about me because having that wonderful balance between business and personal is very important. Okay, so represent about 20 mitigation banks throughout the state of Florida. Some are state only, some are federal only, some are dual. Some people call it dual, some people call it joint. That means state and federal credits. Um, we talked a lot about these esteemed panelists, about state versus federal. And you can have a state-only bank, you can have a federal bank, but it's more advantageous to have both. And I'll tell you why, because if credits are needed for federal and you only have state, you will potentially lose that project unless you can pair it up with another bank. So to be able to be fully equipped, you want both state and both federal, just like Chris said with the shoes. You can have a left foot only, but you'd like to have one. So this is Rainy Creek Mitigation Bank. It's 3,520 acres. It's permitted in 98. One of the first mitigation banks. This is phase three. Just got implemented. We just got our first credit release. And uh, this bank has been a huge uh, restoration uh, success story and uh, uh, anticipates to probably be sold out in the next three to five years. And we're seeing an emerging trend you know, after being in the industry for 25, 30 years, mitigation banks are selling out. And uh, because it takes 20 to 25 years sometimes to sell out a bank, especially if they have a lot of credits. You can go ahead. So my numbers kind of differ from yours a little bit, but because I don't count phase twos of banks, so if it's in like Everglades, phase one and phase two, I only count that as one. So approximately 87 federal, uh, 123 state, 41 about, uh, 41 banks are currently federal. Is that right for you? I wrote it down, it's about that. <clears throat> Go ahead. And here's a map that shows the location of the mitigation bank. So you can kind of see, this one is the state, but you can see where all the banks are located within the state of Florida and where they're really highly situated. And these blocks, there's so many, they had to create another legend key. And then the next slide is federal banks. And as you can see, there's less. But you can see the areas that are covered and the areas that are not. Now, some areas have one mitigation bank, and some have eight, and some have none. So it's very, very important to identify the location to find out what particulars are involved. Okay, so we already talked about this a lot. Well, the experts took care of this for me. But um, just to give you a quick overview, for mitigation banks, these are the type of activities you need to do to get credits. 
Uh, and like Chris and Penny and Cliff said, preservation, put the conservation easement on it, put the financial assurances, restore the hydrology, remove the exotic species, plant native species, prescribe fires, and the credits are awarded per activity or performance base when you show that it's been met. And monitoring and maintenance reports are due every year to state and federal to make sure that you are staying compliant. And if you don't, they will freeze your credits and you won't be able to sell anymore. And that's happened quite a few times, but not too many. And it's something to be very, very, very careful about. And playing with nature is no easy feat. Here's an example of a credit release schedule. This bank was approximately 400 acres. It was awarded 56 credits. The majority of the time, your state credits will not match your federal credits. This could be a federal release. The state might be 50, 100% more, it really depends. Corps will not give you credits for uplands, but the state will which will dramatically affect those numbers. But anyways, as you can see, 15% for the uh, conservation easement and financial assurances, that's the same line item. And that can range from 10 to 20%, like you said. And then other things like the construction, the installing the low water crossings, the control structures, earthen ditch block, all the different kinds of act uh, activities. And then you get the credits once you prove that you've done this. So you complete the planting plan, you get 20%. This is six months after you get the first um, six months post issuance. Now, what I have seen is if you are specific as far as, and you, and you need to be specific in your permit, if it says this criteria and you haven't met it, you gotta wait. And sometimes, you know, it's not on target. You thought it was gonna be in a year, and now we got two years. Now, the whole thing's backed up, and I got credit sales going and no credits to provide. So you really gotta make sure that you're on top of it and make sure that you get the credit releases at the appropriate time. And um, there's only a few environmental consultants in Florida that specialize in permanent litigation banks, and they will have to be on it to make sure that this is staying in compliance and they're doing the right thing and that the bank meets the success criteria and the performance standards. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about mitigation credits and how we sell them. So the most important thing for establishing a new mitigation bank, those two different criteria, the main, the main thing that you really need to focus on when permitting a mitigation bank or finding a mitigation bank is the location. Location, 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 just like real estate is mitigation banking. And the reason for that is, if we have a mitigation bank like Greedy Creek Mitigation Bank in Osceola County by Disney, they're gonna have a lot more sales than San Pedro Bank Mitigation Bank in Taylor County up in the Panhandle. Now, things could change over time. Development will be pushed up north, of course. Um, but demand and supply will be different, you know? Um, and it all depends on the uh, projected development in the area. In addition, you need to figure out um, the um, the other competitors. What other options for mitigation are in the area? So there's two other banks, and they're priced at 100,000, and they sell six credits a year. We're looking at the historic ledgers, and we can find out, and we can get an idea of a pro form of a cash flow sheet of what we anticipate. Now, credit sales um, are. Uh, not always the same every year, and actually they never will be. One time you might sell uh, two credits in 2019, and in 2020 you sell 30, you know? And it, so it goes like that. And so it's not a predictive cash flow, which sometimes mitigation bankers can get antsy, but you gotta be patient, because like I said, one year you sell one, and next year it's a great year. So it evens out. Okay, so let's talk about the impact side. So you have a project, a landowner wants to build a driveway, and the only way they can do it is if they impact a half an acre of weapons. And they say, how much is this gonna cost me? You know? So you say, where are you located? I'm located at 129 Cherry Creek Circle in Winter Spring. 
Okay, well, you're in the Lake Jessa Basin. There's no mitigation banks in this basin, but there's offsite mitigation available for the state. And we compare it with federal over Cameron for the poor. So you're thinking of a half acre of impact. What we need to do is you need to call an environmental consultant. And we need to figure out what the quality of the wetland is that you're impacting. Makes all the difference. And I'll tell you why. If credits are $100,000 and you have a low quality wetland and one acre of impact, let's say the low quality is a, you know, a 0.4, that's $40,000 an acre of impact. Versus, I have a higher quality wetland that gets you a score of a 0.7. You can click the slide, I think it's next. 70,000. So now we're looking at 40 to 70,000 dollars a wide disparity per acre of impact depending on the quality of your wetland impact. Nothing to do with my mitigation budget. So it's very, very important to hire an environmental consultant to be able to perform, perform those UMAM numbers to be able to find out what the quality of the wetland is because that will dramatically determine the price of the credits. Mitigation credit, we all know about this. Location, landscape, water environment, community structure, um, how a mitigation bank or mitigation credit is derived. Slide. Mitigation credit does not equal an acre. I know you all know that, but a lot of people don't. I say credits are 100,000, they go, oh my God. I go, don't worry, you don't need all, you don't need full credit. You only need, you know, maybe 0.6 credits for an acre, depending on the quality. So they calm down. So that's a really common misconception that education is needed for the individual landowner. And then here we talked about the UMAM. It goes from a zero to a one. Low quality example, it's like a 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Average is like a 0 0.6. High quality is like a 0.8. And you guys know better than I how to figure that out. Keep going. Service area. So this is where it gets a little interesting. Every, there's five different water management districts, as you know, and every water management district provides a service area a little different. There's 86 different basins, and you can hit that slide. And depending on where you're located, uh, which water management district depends on, will determine your service area. For example, this is that Reedy Creek mitigation bank I was talking about before in Osceola County. They're in South Florida Water Management District. They were permanent back in the 90s, like I said. They got over 10 basins, 10 drainage basins, to be able to provide in their service area. Now that's not, that is rare. That's not usual. And the reason they got that is because it's permanent in the 90s. But also, because it's in South Florida Water Management District, which are really little, tiny drainage basins. So they give you, you know, five, ten, depending on what you can prove is uh, acceptable. Now, with South Florida Water Management District, before we go to St. John's, you can provide a QO of impact assessment. So if I want to use Reedy Creek Mitigation Bank, which is located in the Reedy Creek Basin, my project's in Shingle Creek Basin, what do I do? I can use Reedy Creek, but I have to provide a cumulative impact assessment to, to show that there's going to be no uh, net loss and no adverse impacts and, and that um, everything's good. South Florida is very, um, the approval process is very quick and easy. Uh, the environmental consultant will plug in the specific data for the wetland impact to make sure that it will have no negative effect since it's going out of basin and then it's approved and we're good. Different districts are different. SWIFMA, well actually let's say talk about St. John's. St. John's, you primarily get one basin only. Sometimes you might get two, maybe if it's a nested basin or not, and you still will have to provide that fuel of impact. Like Colbert Cameron, also permitted in the 90s. And the, when you were permitted, changes everything. If you're permitted in the 90s versus today, things are different. <clears throat> We've got more higher standards, which is a good way to go. But, um, but it's like Cobra Cameron, they have like four or five different basins, but they can only provide mitigation of one basin. And they really can't even provide a cumulative impact assessment. I mean, they can, but it's very hard to get approved. Very hard. So 
St. John's is more stringent on the view of impact in South Florida. Slide. Swift mud. Don't even, I don't even think they would allow a human impact. I mean, if they allow it, it's very, very rare. They uh, really, really like to stay in the basin. Um, they like you to be in kind and in basin. And other water management districts could be flexible. They could say, okay, we want you to stay in basin. We understand there's no more forestry credits. You can use, utilize probations. Swift mud, forget it. You don't got forestry credits and I have forested impacts, sorry. You either have to find off-site, on-site, or, you know, not move forward the project. So a lot of projects are deterred because of this situation. And with Swift Mud, you only get one base. Very rarely do you get two. You'd have to show the hydro connection. Hydrological connection. Go ahead. South Florida, we talked about. See how little those bases are. That's why you get a couple more than anywhere else. Go ahead. Swanee River Water Mansion District, very small, about six different basins. Keep going. And then uh, Northwest Florida Water Mansion District, which if you're in this area, you would get, and you would get asked, you would get permitted by DEP. They do not, they're the only district, correct? You're the only district that doesn't provide ERP permits. They they bring that over to uh, to DEP. Slide. Okay. So my perspective on the administrative policies and barriers. Um, <clears throat> let me just do this, and I'll turn around. Hold on, let me, let me just catch up here so I don't have to keep looking back. So let's talk about Lotus, and then we'll talk about the assumption. I'd love to get your perspectives. I know everybody's going to have a different one, but is is the way Lotus is now better, or is the way Lotus was better, or you know, how how, how what, what is your take on it? Because I keep thinking. I keep asking, and I'm getting different, conflicting um, answers. Um, now, in Florida, it has not affected it too much. It has affected it, but not as much as other states. Like in Texas, WOTUS completely killed some projects because some banks were completely ethereal ponds. And now, all those credits that were going to be derived from those ethereal ponds they're out of luck. So when I heard that, I was like, wow, uh, Florida does not have an issue at all in that perspective. But there have been several projects, maybe a handful of, as far as I was concerned, uh, maybe five or six out of the hundred projects that I have reserved that no longer need federal credits because of the water spill. So it hasn't affected it that much, but I did have a few reservations for federal and state, and now they no longer need the federal. Sometimes we'll, you know, be able to work at a refund. Sometimes we will. Okay, I found my slide. We're good. Okay, so uh, let's go to Florida Assumption. We're still going through growing pains. We're in month seven, and um, DEP is is doing the best that they can uh, to. Uh, they had 500 applications come over from the court that they had to go through. Um, they've issued, you know, um, several. The, uh, the staff is overwhelmed, um, and we need to be patient with them because they are going through a huge transition. It's not as um, amazing as we thought, but I have hope that it will be uh, very soon as far as we get through this whole process, and it will streamline, if, especially if you are permitting with the DEP for state and now federal. Okay, so barriers to entry. So this is like a good thing and a bad thing all at once, and it kind of depends if you're like in the cool click crew or you're not. As you know, permitting a mitigation bank is not for the faint of heart, and the federal process can sometimes take up to seven years. Sometimes. Um, a lot of the time. Um, and so basically, that's terrible, right? But to the ones that are already in it, the ones that are already permitted, we're in it. 
And we kind of like those barriers to entry because it makes it harder for other mitigation bankers to enter. But at the same time, if you're permitting a bank today, you're not liking those. So it really depends on where you're at. And we appreciate all the due like, diligence and everything that you do to make sure that the standards are high. Okay, strategies of credit sales, why you really came. If you want to permit a mitigation bank, you distracted me. Oh, slide. Thank you. If you want to sell mitigation credits, you know to understand the players. And the players are you, the environmental consultants. And I have up here relationships matter. The relationships you with you when you have with the environmental consultants, me and you, is very important. Because you like doing business with people that you like, right? And you gotta be quick. And you gotta be smart. And you gotta have a lot of knowledge and a lot of history. And so putting all those things together really makes a great recipe. These landowners, even these developers that have been in business for 40 years, some of them have no idea. Like, you know, I've been in business for 40 years, been developing all around Florida, I've never had to deal with wetland mitigation. What do I have to do? So you kind of have to start from scratch and tell them everything so that they can understand. And that's why someone like me, or someone like Kay, can be beneficial, or someone like Desmond, Desmond was in here, to a mitigation maker to sell their credits. Because, or Green Source, help you guys out too, um, because a mitigation banker could be an attorney, could be a private equity fund, could be a rancher. He doesn't want to be on the phone all day with these guys, giving them the 101 on how a mitigation bank works, and give them an idea of how many credits they're going to need, and all this different stuff. You really got to need to know your game so that you can give accurate information and be valuable to people that are looking to understand this whole process. And a lot of it is education. A lot of it. And, uh, I was kind of self-taught uh, all of this and, you know, it took 16 years, but I'm, I'm starting to get it. Okay, so if you do sell credits, and I'm not sure if anybody has, you know, dreams of becoming a uh, mitigation bank sales broker, but the best advice I can give you is be organized. And because, like I said, I've got 100 projects reserved, and i got 20 banks, so I should write down and I did an Excel spreadsheet, but most people are fancier and they have like some kind of CRM. But I just write down everything. Every single little thing that I do. I know some of you have, you know, timesheets and you have to write down everything that you do for the client. I do that just for myself. And then I report to the mitigation banker as well, so that he knows I'm still working for him. But everything. 72721, sent sign agreement. 73021, sent invoice. Every little single tiny administrative or uh, follow-up I report uh, to on this spreadsheet so that I know and I can keep everything in line. And that way I'm not confused and I'm on the same page with the environmental consultant and they just start talking and I'm like, oh yeah, we're talking about that part. And then follow-up. Okay. Best practices for credit lenders. This is so important. I see a lot of mitigation bankers, sometimes reps, not do a full internal audit on a regular basis to make sure they know how many credits are remaining. And um, am I running low on time? Okay, I'm almost and, um, and just make sure that you keep the ledgers in consistency uh, with the state. And sometimes the state might, or federal might, you know, forget one. And so you've got to really keep on it because if they forgot to put 0.3 credits on, um, and now I've sold them all. I didn't keep an accurate ledger. We got we got problems. So you really 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 need to make sure that you keep these ledgers very very precise. Deduct them as soon as possible, as soon as the full payment and the permits are issued, uh, and just get it over with. And then then and then of course the applicant can move forward with development. They cannot move forward until the credits are purchased and transferred from the ledgers. Okay, best practices for mitigation banks. It can go all over the board, but standard is 10% for a 90-day reservation. I've seen banks take $1,000 for a reservation, sometimes 20%, sometimes no deposit. But with those, generally the deposit and sign agreement will get you a reservation letter, which is what you need to be able to get your permit 
that says I will purchase 0 0.123 credits for two acres of impact from X, Y, and Z mitigation benefit. And then once your permit's issued, you deduct the credits from the ledger. Super quick, I know you probably all know about ledgers, but let's just say I got 100 credits, I sold two, I now have 98 left to sell. It's kind of fun. And it's all wonderful other districts. And other water managers districts and DEP. Okay, speaking of, next slide. And I'm gonna run up through these real quick because I know we're losing time. Um, and we wanna go to the FA and Phase Social. Okay, so Rivets, amazing. If you ever want any data, you go to Rivets. It's absolutely amazing what you can find. You can find out contact information, you can find out if your credits were um, transferred, you can look at the FBIs, the mitigation banks, uh, St. John's and other water management districts. Some of them have just as uh, amazing information, but this is a real amazing tool. If you're doing research, you wanna understand the market, you wanna understand your bank, anything, your competition, it's all there. Next slide. This is kind of just a wrap up, but the most important thing, which mitigation banks can service my area? Uh, if you say I need mitigation, I can't tell you one tiny little thing unless I know the location. And that will open it up, you know, and give you exactly what, what's going on. Uh, and then, of course, the information of your wetland score and the acres of impact, those three criteria, you can figure out how much you can anticipate mitigation to cost. Slide, we're done. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you learned a lot. If you have any questions, please let me know or email me, and I'd, I'd love to speak with you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. If uh, you guys could stay with us just a little bit longer, Kate Hutt-Fader's gonna give us an update from the Florida Association